Hey guys, so welcome back to my YouTube channel. So, I mean, I've been seeing your requests. I'm a bit slow to answer on IG because I have a lot going on this week because we have the Unit 1 Marathon tomorrow, the second one of, you know, all the marathon series. And we have, and we'll have the Unit 2, the second Unit 2 Chem Marathon. I think next week, yeah, the Saturday before your exam. So... I've been dealing with all of that, trying to juggle it and thing. But I've seen your messages. I'm slow to answer, but I, I think just now, I spent the hour just now going through all of them on IG and I answered all the messages that were there. Um, so again, I want to thank you guys for your support. And um, basically what I'm going to do today is go through acid-based equilibrium. This is actually the slides that I use in our classes. So um, the group classes really. So we're just going to go through the content and give you guys an idea and remind you about some important things that you need to know when it, as it relates to acid-base equilibrium or equilibria, all right? So first and foremost, we have to talk about the bronsted lowry theory of strong, strong acids and weak acids, right? So ensure that you know how to, how to define what a strong acid is and what a weak acid is. It's very important that you know the definitions for these terms because definitions for the most part on your examination papers are just two marks. You can't actually two marks like that. It's literally something that you just need to know. And once you understand the content, I said this in my whole to um, study for CXC video, I want to update those things though. I said it in my whole to study for CXC video that, hey, you're not studying to remember, you're studying to understand. Once you understand it, you're not going to forget it. Anything you understand, you're not going to forget it. Trust me. So a strong acid, well, I just literally, I'm sitting on a stool and I lean backwards and I almost fell. That would have been a disaster. So a strong acid, a strong acid dissociates completely in um, aqueous solutions meaning that once the H plus ions detaches from the acid molecule or the acid compound, all the H plus ions are going to leave it. So most, of, most likely they, you're going to find that the inorganic acids are the strong acids, while weak acids only partially dissociate in water, so they only donate some of their hydrogen ions. So you're going to find that in the anion part of your acid, you're going to find that hydrogen ions are still present. For example, if you take a look at ethanoic acid right here, ethanoic acid will dissociate in water, so CH3COOH will set up an equilibrium and form the ethanoate ion and the H plus or hydrogen ion, also called a proton, right? So if you look here, along with the detached H plus ion, you're going to find that hydrogen atoms are still present in the anion. And that's the basic characteristic of an, a weak acid. So most carbon containing acids like um, carbonic acid, for example, and all the organic acids, the ethanoic acid, formic acid, or also known as methanoic acid, those citric acid, tartaric acid, those will have, those are weak acids. They don't donate all of their protons or H plus ions, right? Now, in terms of bronsted lowry theory, you should be able to define, define what an acid is and what a base is. And in simple terms, a bronsted lowry acid is a proton donor. So basically a compound that gives away a hydrogen atom or hydrogen ion rather, while a bronsted lowry base is a compound that accepts the donated or takes the donated H plus ion, also called a proton. So that's just a little, a little introduction to like the terms that we'll be using throughout this, this, um, this session. So then we, we can talk about the potential hydrogen, the potential, potential, when you think of the word potential, you want to think about the likeliness of something happening, if it has the potential, let's say you have the potential to pass your exams, you can if you work hard, right? 
if you study up the content and prepare yourself well for the exams, you have the potential to pass it, right? So when we talk about potential hydrogen, we're talking about the likeliness of finding hydrogen within or H plus ions within a solution. So when we're measuring the pH, the pH is determined by the number of the number or the amount of H plus ions present. So whenever the pH is extremely, um, well, the pH value is low and we have a strong acid, that means you have more H plus ions in solution. So whenever you have, for example, you can describe this relationship as an inverse proportional relationship where if the H plus ion if the H plus ion concentration increases, then you'll find that the pH value will decrease because on the pH scale, you go from one all the way to 14. So three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. And so where one represents acidic conditions, just in the center here, seven is neutral. So it's neither acidic nor is it basic. And above seven represents bases or basic or alkaline conditions. And below that is acidic. So yeah. So if you're going to calculate the pH of a strong acid, you'll use the pH is equal to minus log to the base 10 of the H plus ion concentration. If your calculator doesn't put log like this with a box at the bottom, you don't need to put 10, okay? If you just, if it comes up as just minus log, just put the, the, the concentration of H plus ions in brackets after and hit the equal sign because minus log already is to the base 10, right? So unless you're asked to do so, by your calculator to put the 10, don't put the 10. It will really mess with your answers, right? So again, this formula is only for strong acids. And the reason why it's only for strong acids is because strong acids, as I said, completely dis dissociates in water, meaning they donate all the H plus ions. So whatever the H plus ion concentration within, within the solution is, that would be the same as the number or the concentration of H plus ions in the acid compound itself. So let's, I think what's coming next is a little calculation. So let's say you are asked to calculate the pH of 0 0.26 moles per decimeter cube of hydro <laughs> sulfuric acid. I get so used to saying a hydrochloric acid these days. So I always encourage you to write out the chemical equation for this first before building up the expression, because you need to know the mole ratio of everything here. So if you write, if, if you write out the chemical equation, remember acids will break apart or dissociate into their respective ions. So the H plus ions and whatever polyatomic anion. So whether that be the sulfate ion, the bicarbonate ion, you know. So H2SO4 will dissociate to give you the H plus ion and the sulfate ion, SO4 two minus ion. Now, you have to balance your equation. You have one sulfate, one sulfate. However, you have two hydrogens right here. So you need two H plus ions, right? So as you can see, one mole of an acid will dissociate to give you two moles of H plus ions. So if you have 0 0.26 moles per decimeter cube of solution, so that would mean you have 0 0.26 moles of um, sulfuric acid, then H plus ions will be two times that 0 0.26. If you can't like look at it like that and know, you could always set up a, an equation where one is to two, therefore 0 0.26 would be to X and simply cross multiply. So you multiply the top, the, if you've watched my other videos, you know I'm a fan of this method where you multiply the top right number by the bottom left 
and similarly you will then go ahead to multiply the top left by the bottom right and equate each side so two what you're going to have is two times 0 0.26 being equal to one times x one times x is x and two times 0 0.26 is 0 0.52 so with that said the h plus ion concentration is equal to 0 0.52 molar or moles per decimeter cube so you just go ahead and put this H plus ion concentration into the formula where pH is equal to minus log to the base 10 of the 0 0.52, which is the H plus ion concentration. And that will give you your pH as 0 0.28. All right. For these are some questions for you to try. I've included the answers right here. Paley, <laughs> but pause the video, try to work them out without looking at the answers and see if you get them right. So the first one says calculate the pH of the following acid solutions or acid solutions. First one is 0 0.5 moles per decimeter cube of hydrochloric acid. So that's HCl. Again, remember HCl will dissociate to give H plus ions and in this case chloride ions, right? Everything is in a one-to-one -one mole ratio because one mole, if there's nothing before it, we don't usually write ones in chemistry and math. So if there's nothing before it, just um, assume that it is one, right? So one mole of hydrochloric acid will dissociate to give one mole of H plus ions and one mole of Cl minus ions. So then, 0 0.5 will therefore give 0 0.5 and 0 0.5. So that would mean that therefore the H plus ion concentration is 0 0.5 molar. So you'll simply just put that into the minus log to the base 10 of 0 0.5. And that should give you 0 0.301. For this one, H2SO4, that's sulfuric acid and sulfuric acid will dissociate in an aqueous solution to give you H plus ions and SO4, two minus ions. And again, remember you have to balance it. You have two hydrogens over here, so you need two hydrogens here. And so this here, if you have zero, it's a one to two ratio. So if you have 0 0.001, moles of sulfuric acid, you're going to have two times that for the H plus ion. So 0 0.001 times two. And that would mean that two times 0 0.001, that's 0 0.002. I don't know why I'm putting it into the calculator. <laughs> so this would be H plus ion concentration for that sulfuric acid would be equal to 0 0.002 molar. So then you just put that into your minus log to the base 10 of the concentration of the H plus ions, 0 0.002 minus log to the base 10 of the answer that I just got. And you should get the pH being equal to 2.69897, but just write it wherever you want to stop really. So I'm just going to write 2.70. Now the next one is the nitric acid, HNO3. So that's 0 0.25 moles per decimeter cube. And again, you have, uh, what is this? Let's think about it. <laughs> HNO3, it's right there, will dissociate in an aqueous solution to give you H plus ions and NO3 minus ions, that's a nitrate ion. And so everything again, one mole of the nitric acid will dissociate to give one mole of H plus ions. So therefore 0 0.25 will dissociate to give you the same 0 0.25. So now that we've gotten the H plus ion concentration, we can say minus log to the base 10 of 0 0.25 is equal to, and that's the pH of that nitrate, that 0 
moles of nitric acid, which is 0 0.6. So can't even write 0 0.60. There's nothing wrong with that. So I hope those are clear. Now, you'll now be introduced to another thing called the POH. And basically, we'll talk about the relationship with that, with pH and the POH, or the relationship between the POH and the um, pH. So POH is the potential for finding hydroxide ions. So you use this whenever you, you need to calculate the pH of um, bases. Now, as you can see, I hope you realize the little difference with the pH and the pOH right now, because whereas we're calculating acids, acids have H plus ions, right? However, if we look at a base, for example, sodium hydroxide, right? All bases are alkalized, but not all alkalize are bases. So bases are the ones with the OH, right? Hydroxide ions. So if you look at the hydroxide ion, for example, if we put the hydroxide ion, anything that's aqueous will break into its respective ions. So if you put this in water, as long as it's soluble in water, it will break apart into its ions. So if we have sodium hydroxide, for example, and we put that in water, the sodium hydroxide is going to break apart or dissociate into its respective ions, which is the sodium ion and the hydroxide ion. So there is no way to find out the H plus ion concentration. I was going to say a hydrogen ion, but H plus ion concentration here because there are no H plus ions present in the solution. But we do have hydroxide ions. So in this case, what we can calculate is the pOH. And if we calculate the pOH, we're basically going to substitute H plus ion concentration as OH minus ion concentration. And here we go. So you're going to have pOH being equal to minus log to the base 10 again of the OH minus ion concentration. And now is the best time, right, to figure out how to use a calculator. It, it probably sounds silly, but if you're not getting the answers that are here right now, chances are you're not using the calculator properly. So you can always WhatsApp me, ask me, you know, and I'll help you with using the calculator in a case you can't find some, right? Or in a case where you're just not getting the right answer, can take a look at your calculator for you and tell you what to, what to touch <laughs> because it's very much possible. Because even when you're writing, um, if when you're when you're entering um, numbers in standard notation on your calculators, this I bet most of you, if not all of you, put like suppose you're supposed to write one times ten to the minus three in your calculator. You are going to put one multiplication sign, ten, the little hat symbol, raised to the whatever power or roof symbol, and then put minus three. This can really mess with your answers. <laughs> That's not how you're supposed to put in your calculator. Any number raised to the raised to a power, like times 10 to a power, you're going to use the E, X, P. Some people just have it as E, while some people will have the um, italic X, 10, and X. It depends on your calculator, but you're supposed to use this. It's, it's supposed to be near the answer key or the equal button. It's in the last row on the calculator, EXPE or times 10 to something. You use that and then you just put the number directly after. You don't raise it, put the raise to the whatever power symbol either. Just put the number and you should be fine. And it's best to use your brackets so you don't, cal you don't confuse your calculator, right? So one EXP, minus three in calcul in brackets and then continue you know with your calculations so yeah it's while practicing that's the best time to figure out if you're using your calculator correctly because what you need is what you need is consistently correct numbers and you can't really be doing an exam knowing what you are supposed to do but your calculator out there throwing it to the dirt right that does not go work out because you know, we need correct answers. So you knowing what to do and your calculator out there kind of 
how do I say this? Decent. <laughs> Oh my god. So your calculator out oh, here, you're throwing it to the dogs, and you're really in there knowing you're going through, you're doing your questions and sing, 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 and it turned out to everything wrong because you never know if you use a calculator that now cut it. That now go work. That not going to work. So figure out now if you know how to use your calculators. So once we found the POH, what you can do after that is <laughs> a chat so bad. P H plus P O H is equal to 14. Remember, I told you that the P H scale goes from 1 to 14. So if it's a case where you need to find the P H now, after finding the P O H, P H will be equal to 14 minus the P O H value that you found. So this is how you can find the P H of a strong base. Remember, these are only working for strong products, you know, strong compounds, strong acid, strong base, right? I'm going to introduce you to the ice method later, which we'll use for weak acids, right? So for now, if you don't know how I got to here, pH is equal to 14 minus pOH. All I did was a bit of transposition, right? Um, so basically, I wanted to get the equation reading as pH is equal to. And in this case, if pH is equal to, you need to get that plus pOH from that side of the equal sign. So basically what I did, or what you should do to get rid of it, let me increase the thickness, thick. So pH plus pOH, seeing that you're adding or it's a positive POH in order to get rid of it, you do the opposite. So if you're multiplying, you divide, and if you're dividing, you multiply, and if you're subtracting, you add, you just do the opposite to get rid of it. So seeing that we're adding, we're going to do the opposite of that and subtract POH from this side. And that will be equal to 14. And whatever you do to one side, in order to keep the equation homogeneous or equal, you need to do the same thing on the other side. So we have to subtract POH from this side as well. So basically plus POH minus POH will cancel each other out just like a plus two minus two, which is literally two minus two will be equal to zero. Plus POH minus OH is going to be zero. And so PH will be equal to 14 minus POH. I have no idea what that sound was. I think I got a notification. I don't think you guys can hear it though. So then we have the relation, we have a question to work out here. So here they said, what is the pH of 0 0.5 mole per decimeter cube? Also meaning molar, which is the large M solution of sodium hydroxide. And sodium hydroxide is a strong base, so we can go ahead and work out pOH. But as I said, if you're not so sure about the mole ratios, to be safe, always start out by writing a chemical equation so you can kind of visualize what you're doing, right? Because things like this, my coach used to tell me, get where you forget, right? <laughs> so don't throw away marks that you know you definitely can get because there might be a very hard question on that paper, or there's usually that one challenging question on the paper that you're going to lose a couple marks from. So ensure that you can do all of the ones that you know what to do. So you don't lose unnecessary marks because every point counts, okay? So if you have sodium hydroxide, as I said, that's going to dissociate into the sodium or Na plus ion and the OH minus ion, right? And in that case, what you're going to have is the 0 0.5, everything is a one-to-one -one mole ratio. Oops, a one-to-one -one mole ratio where one mole of sodium hydroxide will dissociate to give you one mole of Na plus and one mole of OH minus ions. And so if you put, if you have 0 0.5 moles, therefore, or mole per dm cube of um, literally 0 0.5 moles in 1,000 centimeter cube or one decimeter cube of solution, that's still 0 0.5 moles. So a your your mole is unaffected. So don't pay attention to like volumes and such. 
unless the volume was like 0 0.5 in two, two decimeter cube, then you'd have to divide two into 0 0.5 to get the actual number of moles that you should use, but that ain't, that ain't right now. So 0 0.5 moles of sodium hydroxide will give 0 0.5 moles of sodium ions and 0 0.5 moles of hydroxide ions. So we have the hydroxide ion concentration. And so we can put that into the minus log to the base 10 of the OH minus ion concentration formula. And when we do that, if you put 0 0.5 where the concentration of OH minus should be, should get 0 0.301. And in that case, remember I told you pH plus pOH is equal to 14. So to find pH, you just subtract 0 0.301 from 14. That would give you 13.699. And so as you can see, for a very strong base, you're going to have um, a number closer to 14 than to 7. So you know, your calculations check out. So here is a question. I don't want to scroll down, but I'm going to scroll down so you can look at the answer. Well, not look at the answer, but see the answer as well and work it out. So what is the pH of the following strong alkali, with, um, which is 0 0.01 moles per decimeter cube of sodium hydroxide? Please pay attention if they ask you for pH or pOH, because this is a base. So first, you're going to calculate the pOH, right? Pause the video, work it out for yourself where you have pOH being equal to minus log to the base 10 of the OH minus ion concentration. It's sodium hydroxide, so everything is in a one-to-one -one mole ratio, but I'll show you. Sodium hydroxide will dissociate to give sodium ions and OH minus ions. Surely coming too close. This happens to me all the time, yet I refuse to learn. Let me bring this over a bit. OH minus ion, right? So everything is a one to one mole ratio. So if you have 0 0.01 moles of sodium hydroxide, you're going to have 0 0.01 moles of OH minus ion. So pOH, therefore, would be equal to minus log to the base 10 of 0 0.01, right? 0 0.01. And if you put that into your calculator, minus log to the base 10, please remember to put in the minus log. Put the negative sign before a log. If you don't do that, you're going to get a negative number. And that's basically going to mess with your results in a case where the number was supposed to actually be negative. <laughs> so just remember to put the negative before it. So 0 0.01. And so I got two as my POH. So then remember pH plus pOH is equal to 14. Therefore, pH will be equal to pOH minus, well, equal to 14 minus pOH. 14 minus pOH. And so pH will be equal to 14 minus 2. pH of this is therefore 12. If they asked you for the pOH, like they said, what is the pOH of the following strong alkali? The answer is two. But they asked you what the pH was, so the answer is 12. All right. So then basically this whole acid-base equilibria chapter covers, <laughs> covers, I don't know why I laugh like that, covers uh, all the equilibrium constants, KC, K, not KC, K, A, K, well, K, 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 W, I, did, I don't think we did K, A, did we? No, P, H, P, O, H, but um, K, A, K, B, those are the base dissociation constant, K, B, and K is the acid dissociation constant. So basically you'll work that out by doing the concentration of the products, mm -hmm. the concentration, the product of the concentration of the products divided by the product of the concentrations of the reactants. So that's that's the equilibrium. That's the general thing for equilibrium constants. So if we talk about Kw, which is the ionic product of water, 
we can derive this by looking at the fact that water self-ionizes. So if you put water in water, I hate saying this so much, but if you have water, water is going to break apart to the H plus ions and OH minus ions, right? And so if we are supposed to write the equilibrium constant equation for this, it's going to be, as I said, these are the products. These are the, or this is the reactant. So it's the product of the concentration of the products. So H plus ion times the concentration of the OH minus ion, right? Then you're going to divide that by the concentration of the reactant. No, there is going to be a little issue with this because the concentration of water doesn't change. The concentration of liquids don't change. The concentration of solids don't change. So in your, your KC or your, your, K, your KC, your KP, all these equations, you don't, put, you don't put anything that is unaffected by equilibrium or the concentrations is unaffected. So you don't include liquids in your equations, nor would you include solids in your equations. So this is out. And so we will get a new constant, which is called Kw, which is literally the product of the ions of water, which is called the ionic product. So H plus ion concentration times OH minus ion concentration. Right now, we're going to talk a bit about how to do calculations regarding this. So, if it is that what the temperature of water is 25 degrees Celsius and we're under standard conditions of temperature and pressure, I just told you standard temperature being 25 degrees Celsius, and that would be 298 Kelvin if you're talking about absolute temperature, and the pressure is one atmosphere or 101 kilopascals, then you know that the Kw of water is going to be equal to one times 10 to the minus 14 moles squared per decimeter cube. As long as conditions are standard, you can assume that the Kw of water is one times 10 to the minus 14 moles squared per dm to the minus six. In this case, we can use this value here to work out the, the pH of water. Another fancy thing you should know about water is that the H plus ion concentration is usually, or for the most part, always equal to the OH minus ion concentration. And if that is fact, then Kw can be easily written as the concentration of the H plus ion squared, because if these are the same, let's say this is one and one, this is literally one multiplied by one. If it were two and two, then two multiplied by two. And how can we write these in simpler terms? One squared, two squared, right? So remember anything multiplied by itself can just be squared. So if the values for the H plus ion concentration and the OH minus ion concentration is the same, then you can just simply write one and square it. So OH minus ion concentration squared would also be correct but we're not going that route. <laughs> Definitely not going that route. You're going to get the same answer anyway. Can work it out and try. You can try working it out using OH. But as I said, you're going to get the same answer because they're the same. So in this case, we can work out the pH of water where Kw would be equal to one. Whoa. Yeah, one times 10 to the minus 14 mole squared dm to the minus six. And if we wanted to find H plus ion concentration, we just find the square root of Kw because H plus ion concentration squared, if we find the square root of that, that's simply just H plus ion concentration. And anything you do to one side of an equation, you have to do to the opposite side to keep it homogeneous or equal, right? So you'll find the square root of one times 10 to the minus 14 mole squared per dm to the minus six. This is going to equate to one times 10 to the minus seven mole per decimeter cube. And so we can put this here into the pH is equal to minus log to the base 10 of the H plus ion concentration in order to work out the pH of water. You're going to get the pH of water being equal to seven. 
So the pH of water under standard conditions of temperature and pressure is seven. However, you can find that at different temperatures, the value of Kw will change. However, what does not change is the fact that the H plus ion concentration is equal to the OH minus ion concentration. So yeah, this is a checkpoint. So they said, what is the pH of pure water at 100 degrees Celsius with a Kw value of 1.5 times 10 to the minus 13. So it doesn't change by a lot. So by changing the, so if you write Kw, by changing the temperature, it doesn't change the, 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 it doesn't cause a large fluctuation in the H plus ion and OH minus ion concentration. So for the most part, we can still assume that a still, you know, equal. So in this case, we can still write back Kw is equal to the H plus ion concentration squared and go ahead and work out what the H plus ion concentration is. So Kw being said to be 1.5 times 10 to the minus 13 is equal to the H plus ion concentration squared. Therefore, the H plus ion concentration will be equal to the square root of 1.5 times 10 to the minus 13. And if you put that into your calculator, what you'll find is the H plus ion concentration is equal to 3.8. Let me see if that's what I got in the calculator. Yeah. 3.87 times 10 to the minus 7. And so pH is equal to minus log to the base 10 of the H plus ion concentration. Can put that 3.87 times 10 to the minus 7 into your calculators. I'm not going to clear it out. I'm just going to put it as is in my calculator because I have the value still standing. So I'll just put a minus log to the base 10 of the answer that I just got. And I got 6.4. So pH is equal to 6.4. But it won't make a huge difference in your answer if you didn't do that. So now we can talk a bit about conjugate acid base pairs. So I guess once you understand what a conjugate acid is and what a conjugate base is, you shouldn't have a problem with identifying the conjugate acid base pairs. So simply remember an acid is the thing donating a hydrogen ion or a proton while the, the base would be what accepts it. So you just need to pay attention to what is doing the giving and what is doing the accepting. So anything, you know, anything that is one hydrogen atom short would have been the acid. So that would be the conjugate base and anything that is one hydrogen ion or one hydrogen atom greater, let's say ion, because you're still going to get the the plus charge, the net plus charge. So anything that's a hydrogen ion more than it was when it started, that's going to be your conjugate acid. So basically in um, fancy terms, I guess, the conjugate acid is the anion that will be formed after the acid donates the proton, right? And the conjugate acid is the cation that will form after the base accepts the proton. So here HCl is going to be our, our acid and water is our base. Because as you can see over here, H2O became H3O plus. So this base here, water, accepted the H plus ion given off by the HCl because now Cl is without the hydrogen that it started out with. So in this case, HCl is our acid, H2O is our base. And so H3O plus, that is going to be your conjugated conjugate acid and Cl minus will be your conjugate base. And so if you try these, by looking at these, you should be able to um, identify which one is the acid the base, which one is the conjugate acid and which one is the conjugate base. And here you have 
CH3COOH, that's ethanoic acid and water, dissociating to give the ethanoid ion and the H3O plus ion. Then you have water here and ammonia. <laughs> so that's going to give you a hydroxide ion and the H, then H4 plus ion. So it, this one is quite easy. So this is the acid. This will, water will be our base. And then this here, the H3O plus hydroxonium ion is going to be your conjugate acid. And this is going to be your conjugate base. So H3O plus is basically the conjugate acid because it accepted the, it's a species formed after the base accepted the H plus ion. And the ethanoate ion there is an H plus ion short. So that is telling you that that was the one or the ethanoic acid gave up its, its H plus ion to leave you with that conjugate base. Now, if you look at water and NH3, which one is the acid, which one is the base? Water is the acid, ammonia is the base. If you look over here, OH minus, that is one hydrogen atom short or ion short than you know what we started out with. We started out with water being H2O, and what we're left with is OH minus, right? One hydrogen is missing. That would make OH minus our conjugate base. Water was our acid. Ammonia now accepts the H plus ion. So that's our base. And gave us this conjugate acid, which is the NH4 plus ion, which is the ammonium ion, right? This is what I used to study when I was doing um, CAVE. Yes, I had a lot of worksheets, not worksheets. I had a lot of notes and all I did was I just went through and I took all the important things out of all the note sheets. I found this one particularly helpful. It was concise and I like it. <laughs> so yeah, the acid dissociation constant to find pH of weak acids now. We use the acid dissociation constant to Ka to find the pH of weak acids. Remember what we're doing so far were the strong acids. I think I've been here for an hour already and I, don't, I didn't want to make this long, you know. So basically, if you have an acid HA in water, it's going to dissociate to give you A minus ions and the hydroxonium ion. In simpler terms, if we had omitted water from this whole equation and just said we had an acid HA, that would dissociate to just give you H plus and A minus ions. And it will still be the same when it comes on to writing the, the um, to writing the, the equation. So acids aqueous, water is in liquid state, and the, the ions are aqueous as well. So for Ka, you're only using what is aqueous. So remember I told you that the, the equilibrium constants are given by the product of the products, right? Concentration of the products divided by the product of the concentration of the reactants. So if you do that, and you have to pay attention to the number of moles because if this were two moles of this anion here, you'd have to raise this to two in your, the power of two or square it in your um, equation. And if this were three moles of hydroxonium ion, then you know you'd have to raise that to the power of three in your equilibrium constant equation. That's just a little reminder because I don't want you to guys to forget to do that because that's very important when it comes down to doing these calculations. As I said, remember liquids, the concentration don't change, same for solids. So we omit these from our equation. So Ka of any acid will be equal to the respective anions and the cations form. So I'll just put H plus for now because hydroxonium is basically telling you that it bonded to water. And divide that by the concentration of the acid HA. So that's always the case for weak acids. And if we continue down here, if we're talking about the base dissociation constant, here I went ahead to omit the water from it so that you know we can um, talk a bit about what we're seeing. 
So if you have the base dissociation constant, you use this to find the POH of weak bases, right? Just now we, we used it to find the, the we use the, the acid dissociation constant and we'll further use that to find the pH of weak acids. We use this to find the pH of weak bases. So here, boom, boom, boom. If you have a base represented by the letter B and that dissociates in water, you're going to get the OH minus ions and, you know, BH plus ions. And here, you'll basically do the same thing where you'll do the product of the products divided by the product of the reactants, right? And that will give you the, the, um, the Kb, the equilibrium constant Kb. And what you're going to actually use this to find is the OH minus ion concentration in the solution itself and the H plus ion concentration, if you are using Ka, use it to find the H plus ion concentration within the solution so that you can factor it into or substitute it into the, the pH is equal to minus log to the base 10 of the H plus ion concentration formula. It's also important that you know the relationship between Ka and Kb, right? So what I usually do is I remember that large Ka's or Kb's um, denote strong acids and strong bases. So then for pKa, I know that there is an inverse proportional relationship between you know, Ka and pKa and Kb and pKb. So if Ka is very large, that means the acid is very strong. So then the pKa has to be very small. And similarly, if the Kb value is very large, that means the base is very strong. So the pKb value has to be very small. And if it's opposite, if it were that the Ka were very small, that would mean it's a weak acid. So pKa is very large. And if Kb were very small, then pKb is going to be very large. You can find the pKa value by finding minus log to the base 10 of the Ka value. And similarly, you can find the pKb value by finding minus log to the base 10 of the Kb value. But you, this won't come in, you know, this, this won't come in acid-base equilibrium. You use this when you're you working or calculating buffers, but please know the relationship between Ka and Kb. Wait, Ka and pKa and Kb and K, pKb. So here's a question or a, you know, a simulated question. I usually use like simple ones before giving my students past paper questions to attempt. So what is the pH of 1.2 moles per decimeter cube of ethanoic acid with a Ka value of 1.7 times 10 to the minus five? So as I said, I always encourage you to start out with an, a chemical equation. So if you have ethanoic acid, that's CH3COOH, that will dissociate to give you the ethanoate ion and the H plus ion. And so the Ka for this will be equal to the concentration of H plus ion times the concentration of the CH3COO minus ion and you'll divide that by the concentration of ethanoic acid. Now, if you look here, we only got the pH of ethanoic acid and we got the Ka value, but we don't know concentration of ethanoate ions. Wrong. You do know the concentration of the ethanoate ion indirectly. If you go back to your chemical equation that I usually tell you to write first, you'll see that everything is a one-to-one -one mole ratio. So the concentration of the ethanoate ion is equal to the concentration of the H plus ion concentration. So then we can write this equation as Ka being equal to the H plus ion concentration squared divided by the concentration of the ethanoate ions. And you're probably asking me you now, why isn't it not the H plus ion not equal to 1.2? Because I just thought that to myself, you know, 
why is it not equal to 1.2? Simply because this was before the equilibrium was set up. And this is where the ice method kind of comes in. So basically what you want to think about is ice stands for initial. So before the reaction started, change and equilibrium. So that's E. So initially we started out with 1.2 moles of acid, but the concentration of ethanoid ions and H plus ions would be zero before whatever the process started. And then what you'll find is the change that will occur once we start to approach equilibrium, the concentration of the ethanoic acid will decrease by some amount. We usually just write minus X. The concentration of the ethanoate ions will increase by some amount. So that would be like plus X. And the same thing for H plus ions, which would be plus X as well. So basically at equilibrium, 1.2 minus X will be the concentration of the ethanoic acid and X and X will be the con new concentrations of the ethanoate ion and H plus ion. So as you can see, X and X is, or X is equal to X. So the H plus ion and the ethanoate ions will stay, you know, equal. Will you know, the ethanoic acid concentration will not be equal to the ethanoate ion and H plus ion concentration. So once we've gotten all of this through, what we're working with is this equation here, Ka being equal to the H plus ion concentration squared divided by the concentration of ethanoic acid. So we can fill in the numbers that we were given or the values, which was be the Ka value and the concentration of the acid itself. So what we need to find now is the H plus ion concentration, but we have H plus ion concentration squared here. So basically to get this reading as H plus ion concentration squared, we need to get rid of that 1.2 in the denominator. So this is basically this bar here for a fraction denotes division. So remember, in order to get rid of something, you need to do the opposite. So we'll multiply by 1.2 here. And whatever you do on one side, you have to do to the other side. So we'll multiply by 1.2 on the other side as well. This will cancel this and you'll get one, one. And basically one times H plus ion concentration squared is H plus ion concentration squared. So now what you're working with is 1.7 times 10 to the minus five multiplied by 1.2. And that is equal to 2.04 times 10 to the minus five. And so from that, the H plus ion concentration is going to be equal to the square root of H plus ion concentration squared. And whatever you do to one side, you have to do to the other side. So you have to find the square root of this 2.04 times 10 to the minus five, that's going to give you 4.5, two times 10 to the minus three. And so if the H plus ion concentration within this weak acid is this, can kind of put it or substitute it into the H plus ion concentration here with the pH formula, and we get pH is equal to minus log to the base 10 multiplied by 4.5, two times 10 to the minus three. You should get the pH being equal to two point and I hope that was clear. <laughs> then we talk a bit about titration curves, indicators and such, and then we'll be done with acid-base equilibria. So titration curves, when I mostly see these questions on paper one, to be honest, but it's no biggie to just run through it a bit. Point definitions that you need to know. You need to know the difference between the equivalence point and the end point. The end point is what you observe during a titration. So that color change during the titration, your acid-base titration, that is the end point. For example, if you use phenolphthalein in acidic conditions in your conical flask, you will have, that is if you use the acid or you're titrating a base against an acid in your conical flask, in the conical flask, if you put phenolphthalein indicator, it's going to be colorless, right? No, if you start to titrate the base against that and allow the base to get into your conical flask, you know, shaking gently, the minute you see, and minute stones are a bit long, the, the nanosecond you see a slight pink color, <laughs> stop. And 
look at your beaker, um, look at the solution, allow it to sit, look at it in your beaker. If, this, if the pink color, that's pale pink color stays or stands, that means you've gotten to your equivalence point and you haven't passed it by much. If it is that you, your, your, your solution gets really dark pink, you're way past your, your end point, you're way past the equivalence point and you need to start over. If it is that uh, the color doesn't stay, that means you're close to the equivalence point, but you can you can continue, right? So the equivalence point is the point at which the acid completely neutralizes the base. So the, that would be where the H plus ion concentration is completely equal to the OH minus ion concentration within your vessel. And this is indicated by the end point, which is the visible or the observable color change that you'll see in your conical flask. Equivalence means equivalent, so equal. So when the H plus ion concentration is equal to the OH minus ion concentration, that is your equivalence point. But the end point is your the the observed the observed the 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 observable um, change in your in your conical flask. So if you titrate a strong acid against a strong base, you'll get a curve looking like the first one here. And the equivalence point will be located near seven, right, right at the center. If you do a strong acid against a weak base, you'll find that the equivalence point is here. And if you use, for example, a weak acid versus a strong base, a weak acid is closer to seven than to zero. So hence why the line starts all the way up here. And the strong base is 14. So strong bases are closer to 14 than to seven. So that's why we start all the way up here. This dip here at the center of that dip is where you'll find your equivalence point. So the equivalence point falls a bit above seven. So you need to use an indicator that has a range within that region there. So we're going to talk a bit about that later. And if you do a weak base against a weak acid titration, then <laughs> there is no suitable indicator that will be able to help distinguish that endpoint or that equivalence point there. So when we talk about indicators, you need to know that the indicator, the indicators will react by changing their colors due to a change in the pH of your, your solution. So basically, you want whenever you're doing an acid-base titration, you need to choose a suitable indicator that has a range within your equivalence point. So for a strong acid, strong base, you have a wider um, array of um, indicators to choose from here. This example shows phenolphthalein and methyl orange. While here, for a strong acid, this is weak base, you'll find that phenolphthalein falls outside of the range of the equivalence point. So that it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be appropriate to use phenolphthalein as an indicator here. Well, methyl orange falls within that range. So methyl orange would be the indicator of choice for this strong acid weak base titration. Similarly, if you use a, if you did a weak acid strong base titration, methyl orange would fall with outside of the range of the equivalence point. So phenolphthalein is your best bet here, right? And here we go, a weak acid weak base, you won't find a suitable indicator that can suit your um, experiment. So we, you would not use an acid-based titration method for you know um, a weak base, weak acid, maybe conductometric or yeah, conductometric or thermometric. Thermometric depends on the acid and base that you're using, but that's unit two stuff. But anyways, so this was it for acid-base equilibria. I think I covered everything that you need to know. As I said, I just went through what we'd go through in our usual classes. This is such a little PowerPoint I, I use in class. Um, so yeah, and as I said, I, I think I think I think I just made this. I think, I don't know. Tell me what you think in the comments. And again, if you're sending me any more messages on Instagram, I'll tell you that I'm trying, I'm trying to get to them, but you have to see with me, right? So thank you guys for the support. Thank you for watching. Until next time, I'ma say bye for now.
bye for now and all the best on your exams coming up, all right? So, um, oh, my ultras always be looking shaky, sounding shaky. Hey, remember to subscribe, tell a friend, set, share this video because you know you have classmates, right? Um, drop a like on the video, subscribe to my channel, watch the ads, watch the ads. I don't even, it don't even matter if you watch the ads. I don't know if it matters if you watch the ads, but them say for watch the ads, so watch the ads. <laughs> and yeah, go follow me on Instagram at underscore C-A-M underscore E-O. My name is Camille Lee, by the way. And uh, go follow me on my business page at, page at young underscore genius or official. There, all my handles are down in the description below. And don't miss when I'm having things, right? Because you guys be missing them if you're not following me. So yeah, bye guys. It funny, so I'm not, um, I will not be, what you call this now? I will not be editing this video, so you're going to see me shuffling, but bye guys.